Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Samuel, founder of a revolutionary medical sales training and mentorship program called the Medical Sales Career Builder. And I'm also host of the Medical Sales Podcast. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire world. It doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing and diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 10% performer within your role, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. And remember, I am a medical sales expert sharing my own opinion about this amazing industry and how it can change your life. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Samuel, and today we have with us another special guest, and she goes by the name of Sydney Selby. But why is today's episode so special? Besides the fact that we have a phenomenal woman that I cannot wait for you to hear from, we must acknowledge that it is the week of Mother's Day. So we could not have a podcast episode that is not in the vein of Mother's Day, and everyone, this is it. So you're going to hear from Sydney Selby, and you're going to hear why she's so fascinating and the amazing medical sales career she's had, where she started as a sales rep, and today she is global vice president of a company about to be doing major, major things in the medical sales space. But I am not going to give it away. I am not going to spoil it. This is an episode that you have to listen to. If you're someone that wants to get into medical sales, you're not doing yourself any favors if you don't listen to this episode because she drops gems and pearls. And if you're someone that's in medical sales and that has some ambition and wants to take your career further, then this is an absolute must listen. As always, we do our best to bring you guests that are doing things differently in the medical sales space. And I really do hope you enjoy this interview. Hey, Sydney, how are we doing today? Hi, Samuel. Nice to see you. It's great to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Happy to see you. So why don't you tell the audience who you are and what you do? So my name is Sydney Selby. I work with Renata Medical. I'm the Vice President of Sales Marketing and Medical Education globally. And we are a small startup company based out of Newport Beach, California. Wow. Wow. To be based out of Newport Beach, California. I, 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 don't, I, I have to just spend some time there before I even continue the rest of it. What is that like? Life is pretty good. Uh, I work with a great office of um, employees, um, and we're a small company right now at the moment. We're expecting our FDA uh, approval probably in Q4 of this year, and it's really fun to work for a startup. These guys have a great time in the office. We're very close, congenial, uh, collaborative. And we all do a lot of everything. So it's certainly wonderful because you can expand your uh, skills and talents in a, in a small startup. You have a lot of responsibilities, different responsibilities that I've never had to do before. So it certainly mm-hmm. makes me go grow from a professional perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us, tell us specifically, what is Renata Medical? What is the uh, technology we're talking about here? What do they do? Absolutely. So um, again, we're based out of Newport Beach, California, and we are specializing in pediatric congenital heart disease. So these are basically patients that are born with a congenital heart defect. And where we specialize is innovating in devices for these infants. And then the challenge with infants is that they start at a very young age and they grow unlike adults. So um, our challenge when you're making devices is to be able to make devices that grow with the child through their somatic growth. And that's something that's very challenging in the market today. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. So we make a device called the Minima uh, Renata um, Stent System. And so the Renata Stent System is a device that can be put into the pulmonary arteries or the aorta. And it actually avoids uh, open heart procedures where it's indicated. And it really changes kind of the, the health pathway for that child and the family of that child um, for the future. So it's really kind of a neat solution. And um, some of the challenges that those pediatric interventional cardiologists have to deal with every day is quite amazing. I mean, they truly are innovators in the space because there's so little uh, product offering for these right. folks. patients. And and, you know, that's, I kind of want to get into that a little bit. What is the challenge with this condition right now? What, what is the, the, the maybe top three things that clinicians continue to bump their heads against when they're trying to manage this condition? It's great that you asked me that. I was just at a convention last week and 
we the the physicians that I talk to are amazing. I mean, really have hearts of gold, really um, committed to this space. But because it's so highly specialized, a lot of companies don't have a dedicated um, innovation strategy specific to pediatric congenital heart disease because it's so small. Um, so the space is small and they're challenged with FDA approved devices that they can use that are studied and um, really um, designed for these little babies that are gonna grow. Oftentimes they're innovating themselves and taking adult products that are off label oh, wow. and putting them in the patient, but they have to because they have nothing. And oh. space is relatively small. Um, and so a lot of the big strategic companies incorporate a pediatric portfolio into a bigger, broader picture. But often, again, because the space is so small, it gets overlooked and, and maybe they don't necessarily vest their dollars in this particular market. So this is kind of where um, my, my CEO and COO, they came from a big strategic organization along with myself, and we saw that happen over and over again. And so we really wanted to be highly specialized to provide, you know, these solutions to the interventional cardiologist and for these babies. You know, it's really, it's quite unique. So is it, is it too much of a statement to say that as of right now, clinicians in this space are almost like they're in the wild, wild west. We're trying to manage this. Yes, but it, and you can see why. In fact, last week when I was at this conference, they just don't have options. So the options might be higher risk. Uh, and these kids are very, they're born quite sick. You know, they have multiple disease state etiologies that are challenging. And so, um, you know, not to any fault of their own, they're just trying to make do of what is out there. And most of those devices are clearly adult devices that are not designed for this or may not have been studied. And so um, it, this is a really exciting breakthrough revolutionary product and our, our community is extremely excited about it. So we're really happy. I can only imagine, I'm sure there's a lot of passionate clinicians that have been trying to tackle this thing. They're like, thank you for finally being here. It's um, true. So so in, in the description of Renata Medical right now, it, it, it mentions series B. You know, I think it's important for our audience to know what that type of thing means. I think the startup world, especially when it comes to medical devices, it's becoming more and more prevalent. I would say there's there's more and more startups every single day uh, because of the because of how empowered we've all be, we've all become in being able to get people together to tackle these solutions. What does it mean to be a Series B? So that's just the terminology for the stage of funding. Um, so we're we're privately funded as an organization. Oftentimes people will look at venture capitalists, you know, to support until you're commercialized and you know in the black making money. So Series B, is, B just means the round of funding. So so the round of funding means, the, and it kind of indicates the phase the company is in. When people hear that. Is that the time to get excited that this this is actually going to happen? Is that the time to say, well, let's see, you know, give us a little bit about the uh, sentiment behind being at a stage where you can get Series B funding? Well, we're always excited. I mean, every little thing that we do is meaningful to us. And, and um, you know, I'm not at uh, liberty to share a lot of details, but what I can say is, I mean, we're always excited with the next gen we're working on or, you know, just the little milestones because it's so meaningful for a, a smaller organization that's in a startup mode. Uh, but I think the real time to get as excited is, you know, clearly when you have FDA approval and uh, and then also when you've completed your trial endpoints and you've completed your audit. So, you know, we're well along in the process. And so we're we're truly excited on these milestones. Renata has been exceptional in hitting all their milestones that they committed to to their uh, investors and to the marketplace. So but it hasn't been without, um, you know, without a lot of partnership with our in, uh, physician community. We've got really great relationships with some key institutions in the United States and, and really key uh, KOLs that have been great partners with us. And so that makes all the difference in completing, completing you know, the, the milestones that are required to get approved. Um, so we're really thankful for that. And we've had great trial partners to um, meet our endpoints that we, we expect uh, will be all published, you know, published later this year. That is, that is so exciting. So, you know, one thing we talk about 
when it comes to understanding these different spaces, especially specialized space with this, is the makeup of what a sales team could look like to sell something like this. With a, with a product like this, it, would it be more an individual sales rep having their own territory, kind of giving free reign to make it happen? Or is there more of a team dynamic where there's a lot of support? Well, it's a combination of both, I would say. So uh, I have had the privilege of developing the go-to-market strategy for the organization. And we, we will have a sales team that have individual responsibilities to drive the business and support the business clinically uh, and to support the business from a revenue generating perspective and everything that requires in, in the startup phase of building out an organization. But what's always been really important to me is every single person that I hire, I think about the makeup of the organization and long-term growth with the organization. So I'm always looking for people that will grow their career with us because especially now because it's a great time to get in because we will have, we'll continue to expand and that through the expansion will be opportunities, not only just in the United States, but also around the world. So we're really looking forward to creating that career path. So to answer your question, there's individual, you know, contributor responsibilities, but collectively as a team and really uniting on the mission is how, how we get there. And we have to learn, you know, from each other. So one of the things as a leader that I really have always proactive actively done is make sure that we celebrate our successes together, but we're also very transparent and mm -hmm. celebrating the successes, but discussing where we might have made, you know, a, a grave error. Sure. You know, in our job, it's it could be the cost of a life. You know, maybe we're the last person standing between, you know, a, a good decision and a bad decision and trying to help influence the best outcome for that patient. So of course our physicians are exceptional, but we also know our products and we might know some nuances and things that might make a difference. So, you know, I always try to tell the team, we come together as a team and it's important for me that we have a really uh, strong bonded team because that kind of is what sticks when the times get tough. So absolutely. That is exciting. So let's let's take it back to you because you're now at the at the uh, forefront of this amazing opportunity as global vice president of sales and marketing. We got to know how did you get here. So let's go all the way back. We're going back now to college. Oh you're, gosh, you don't want to go back that far. <laughs> college. We're going to graduate, and are we, thinking, are we thinking? You know, one day, I think I know I want to be a global vice president of sales and marketing, or we think of something completely different and it has nothing to do with this. So there's two parts to that equation. Um, I always knew I wanted to be in leadership because I was really bossy as a little kid, always, always doing, you know, you had to be in the joy club or something like that. So I always knew I wanted to be in leadership. And so that was really important to me. When I graduated, I actually graduated from ASU in Arizona and you know, you, I think your parents are a great influence on what you think you might want to do. So my mom was a very successful commercial real estate broker. And my father was a big wig uh, who served for uh, the Department of Public Safety and, and the Phoenix Police um, Police Department. And so I studied justice studies, which kind of followed, you know, my father's footsteps in sure. some regard. But then I decided to go into sales. And that was really from the good guidance of a great mentor and my mom. My mom has been a huge mentor in my life. And I determined that at that time uh, that um, I had done an internship in college for the, um, the, uh, the uh, a law office and um, the attorney general's office in, the, in Arizona. And I decided that wasn't for me and I couldn't see a long-term career with that. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try sales. What am I gonna do for sales? And so my sales career started really early. My dad, actually, this is a funny story, used to take me out um, and we'd chop wood. I have, I, have, I have three older sisters, so I'm the youngest. Okay. He treated us all like boys, um, motorcycle riding, chopping wood, crane, you know, cleaning horse corral pins. Sure. He taught me great work ethic, so did my mom. But I don't think anybody ever necessarily says, I, I want to be a salesperson. I, I, it wasn't for, it wasn't innate for me, sure. but I knew I was good at talking to people and I liked what I saw in my mom's business. So 
I started out, um, you know, just really in the copier business, which was really tough. And I did that for seven years. I learned how to cold call, you know, get doors slammed in my face, all the, you know, resilient things you have to learn as a salesperson. So, you know, at the time I, I look back at it, even then it was fun, but I think about, you know, I just knew there was something more that I, that I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I just didn't know exactly what it was. And then I had a life experience with my daughter being born, Alexis, as a premature baby, and she had a congenital heart defect. And so I knew at that time that I just fell in love with the nursing staff and the physicians and the care she received. And I knew at some point I wanted to, that it was that moment, it was a life-changing moment, not only, of course, personally, but professionally, yeah. that that was the direction I wanted to go. I wanted to get into medical device sales because it was so meaningful. Wow. And I'd say anything to your listeners, you know, follow your heart because the, the, the beauty of that is it never feels like work because it's just your mission and you're inspired naturally. And that, I mean, I would get a high when I'd go into the hospitals, you know, every time I'd be like, this is the place I'm supposed to be. It's just, it's incredible. So um, I would say, because we do so much of it, if you can make it your mission because you're truly passionate about it, um, that it, you'll never be sorry about that. So that would be you know, one thing I would tell your listeners as they're thinking about the career they want, pick where it's meaningful, and then you have to start somewhere. So you, you don't always usually get first shot on goal in going, you know, doing the product you want or necessarily the company you want, but get your foot in the door. And then there's a, a progressive way to get to the end goal, you know, to your pathway that you'll, that you'll, you'll go, you know. I love that advice. I love that advice. Um, so let's, let's, let's take it further then. So you jumped into medical sales. Uh, let's take it to where you were a surgical sales representative for Medtronic. So, the, so, so, so now we're back, uh, in, in, in an earlier time and, and you, you were killing it. I mean, you were, you got rookie of the year, you won multiple awards. You automatically started with strong performance that you took to your career. I want to jump to where you decided to go from individual contributor to your first leadership position. So it looks like it was with, well, it looks like it was with Medtronic actually. That's so right. talk to us about that. You know, what was going on? Was this deliberate? Were you tapped? You know, how do you, how did you make that transition, that first leadership transition? Um, well, I have in that woman who, who um, hired me, her name's Margaret. She's still a dear friend of mine and, and mentor and just love her to death. Um, she took a chance on me. She actually had another individual um, that she, she, I'll start with Medtronic, the position. So she could have chosen another individual as the rep. So she hired me into the organization. And then, you know, performance gets the attention of people. And so often you're hired into a leadership role because of your sales performance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a disconnect between coach and player, right? So it can, it can be a, a hiring mistake that mm -hmm. often organizations do. Sure. Um, and, but for me, I always knew I wanted to get into leadership. And the first year, when, when you take me back to that time, I actually was promoted at, to uh, manage and lead the team that I was on. So that's very weird for people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Your, your colleagues are like, absolutely. I'm not going to, she's not going to tell me what to do. Yeah, right. I mean, of course. Exactly. So you have to, it can be lonely at times. You know, there was moments I had to make some really tough decisions. There were some individuals that I, I thought, you know, unfortunately uh, weren't contributing and I knew that. So I, you know, set expectations as a leader and I think you observe the first, it's important to take time to observe and not make rash decisions initially when you're put into that position, especially in this case. Um, and so I did have to, to uh, terminate an individual and that, you know, of course, wasn't popular. Mm. And I, I quickly learned that, you know, it can be lonely at times, you know, it's not, I wasn't hired to be popular. I wasn't hired to, to, um, 
you know, uh, make sure everybody was, you know, happy, but I was hired to make sure everybody was productive and to toe the corporate line of what we needed to get done and get accomplished. And that sometimes was very difficult because I love the people that I worked with and who, um, uh, you know, were on my team. And I'm such a people person, but as a leader, you really have to, you know, make some tough decisions at times. And, and that wasn't quite natural really early on in my leadership career, but I really loved it. I really have always um, loved leadership. Typically, you know, from a compensation perspective, it's, it's usually less if you were, if, than if you were a really good rep. Um, so you, you have to be in it for the right reasons. And I've always taken leadership and thought about what an honor and a privilege it really is. I can impact a lot of people's lives and their families. And so for me, I just I just love leadership and it was just really natural, you know, and building teams and being able to do that. It, it really has been a fortunate a part of my career. So then being such a fan of leadership, I mean, if, if you had to answer this question to the best of your ability, what is the secret sauce? You know, you know, I think you nailed it when you said that it's a, it's a, it's almost a fallacy to assume that an individual, a high performing individual contributor is going to be a rock star manager. Uh, there's, 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 there's enough things there to consider that can make that true or untrue. But for you, it was true. And, and, and then you went ahead and did it as a manager, <laughs> which got you to your second line leadership. So what was your secret sauce? If, if you had to answer that question, What's the thing that you kept, the reoccurring theme that you utilized to get the same level of performance you gave yourself out of the people that you decided to lead? Yeah. Um, well, first, it's shocking to see, you know, not everybody works like you. So you have to get over that quickly. And it's no longer me, it's we. And you hear that, but it really is about that. So uh, for me, I think the secret sauce was number one, uniting people on the mission. And there's nothing more inspiring than, you know, if you can all align to that, You, if you have the ability to hire your teams, which is really a gift, um, you know, trying to get that right. So are they in it for the, the right reasons? Um, and again, keeping in mind for me, that's how I got started. So it's really, it's really my true north, mm -hmm. um, just making sure we stay uh, patient centric and focused. I've left forty thousand dollars on the table before um because it wasn't it wasn't the right thing to do you know for the patient and so i think saying really patient centric is super key and then your career will continue to unfold in the med device business if you keep that you know that focus as a leader i think the big things for me were and i made mistakes all the time of course you know but you you have to take time to reflect mm -hmm. on your mistakes and you have to take time to build and establish collaboration with cross-functional partners and build your stakeholder support. So, you know, there were times I made an error where really my biggest cheerleader was maybe only my boss, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's a mistake. I think you have to really be sure you have great relations across the board mm -hmm. and all different functions, especially the higher you go up. Mm -hmm. because you you are you know you you are over a bigger scope of responsibility which involves multiple touch points and, and multiple cross functions but i think for me in leading a team it was about empowering them being decisive i'm an extremely decisive person sure. um being attentive and responsive when they have needs and really being clear on kind of the object objectives and priorities are super important. I think gray uh, as a leader doesn't do, doesn't sit well with a lot of people. I think you have to be, you know, of course, very approachable, your door open. And again, you know, leverage the learnings and take time to reflect to make your team better. And I think also it's important to really understand what motivates them, um, you know, love on them as individuals and uh, be sure that you understand the corporate objectives and you, you, you bring the two together, you know? So I think that's really important. I've never been a person to manage up. Um, I've always, I've always, I'm just, that's just not my way. Um, and it's probably cost me some jobs along the way, I'm, I'm assuming, or delayed my timing for promotion because I, I do, I'm not a manage up person. I'm a straightforward, straight shooter. You, you get, what you get out of me and I'll, I'll just be straight up with you. So 
Usually the team likes that, but sometimes that can be a challenge. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. And I want to let you know our programs cover the entire career of a medical sales professional. From getting into the medical sales industry, to training on how to be a top performer in the medical sales industry, to masterfully navigating your career to executive level leadership. These programs are personalized and customized for your specific career and background and trained by over 50 experts, including surgeons. Our results speak for ourselves and we're landing positions for our candidates in less than 120 days in top medical technology companies like Stryker, Medtronic, Merck, Abbott, you name it. Would you run an Ironman race without training and a strategy? You wouldn't. So why are you trying to do the same with the medical sales position? You need training, you need a strategy, and you need to visit EvolveYourSuccess.com, fill out the application, schedule some time with one of our account executives, and let's get you into the position that you've always dreamed of. I'm going to be honest. I, I have not heard of someone ever say they are not a manage up person. I've heard of people say I've, I had to manage up, I didn't manage up or whatnot, but not a manage up person. Interesting. When you say it that way, how are you defining, well, how do you define what it means to, to manage up? I do. So I, first I think, um, I would define it as, um, um, maybe often it's, it's perceived as a negative a perception of doing what or saying what they want to hear I see. your, okay. your leaders. And you're and, not, a, you're not, you're definitely not a yes woman. N- exactly. <laughs> Yeah. That probably sum, summarizes it in, you know, the best and people who, who worked for me or I've worked for, um, would tell you that. And so I think, you know, that, that can be very positive in many ways. And then also can, you know, ha- you can have setbacks if, if you're not careful. And so I think that's super important. You know, for me, I, I truly give my heart into everything I do with my job and my career. And so when I make recommendations, you know, or I, you know, say something, I'm really thinking about it holistically as a company as a whole. So I feel really good about and really strong about the recommendations I make. But sometimes, you know, maybe that doesn't align with the organizational's view. I'm going to be honest, Sydney, you know, I've, I've I've been sitting in this in this chair talking to amazing, you know, powerful career professionals like yourself for the better half of four years now, and I have not met one yet that was that was an adamant non yes person. <laughs> I, I I'm under the belief that to get to where you are and beyond, you better not be a yes person, and if anything needs to needs to show, you need to be decisive like you're saying and you need to have really good evidence on why you're so doubled down on whatever your belief is what what you're saying is really key because it's not about belief for me so i think for me it's about when i make a recommendation it's very fact-based mm. so i get my facts together mm-hmm. and then i will say here's what i think and here's even if it's against so it's hard to argue with facts it's, it doesn't mean that it's not done. Right. It's it's easier to argue with emotion. So I'm really I take the emotion out of the equation. I really approach how I build a business, you know, based on facts. And I really learned that from my leader, my former leader at Medtronic. Mm-hmm. So she taught me a lot. She was a great mentor, tough, but she taught me a lot. And um and she always would say, you know fact-based, be fact-based. So that always sticks in my head and it's really true. But if you do that, you, you stay, you know, you kind of stay objective and that's the important part. I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay. So you started in cardiac surgery and then you moved into management in cardiac surgery. And then you went into second line leadership uh, as the director. Talk to us a little bit about, so, so cardiac surgery as a manager, and then as a director, you were dealing with uh, therapy development, catheter-based therapies, core valve pivotal trials. That's, that seems like a, a world of difference there. Talk to us a little bit about two, two, two-pronged question. What was the difference in how you had to adjust your leadership style? And then what was the difference in the specificity of the uh, condition you're now dealing with as opposed to just cardiac surgery? 
So those are great questions. Core valve, I, which is called, uh, it's a transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So it's delivering an aortic valve through a catheter okay. instead of surgery. So sure. um, that's the actual therapy. In 2010, we at Medtronic went to non um, competitive sites. So it was in the early clinical trial stages, and there was only about 40 centers in the United States that were currently doing this therapy, actually therapy. So I'm not just even talking about the device, okay. I'm talking about the therapy. Sure. And so they asked me to leave commercial and be a leader of a trial team that was going to bring this product to market. So Clearly, that was a very different thing than what I had done from a leadership perspective. So automatically, the posture was very different. I was fortunate because we were actually bringing to market the therapy and many interventional cardiologists wanted to be a part of this. This is going to be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really was because it, you know, aortic stenosis patients would pass away if they had, you know, the severe state and they were really high risk, they couldn't afford to do surgery. So in two, two years, those, those people would pass away. Sure. So it was life changing revolutionary technology. Um, so by following the innovation that really afforded me a little bit of a, a, a kind of a different posture with how I went to market. We were in a trial, many physicians, those physicians that, um, you know, we taught the therapy to became lifelong friends and mentors and now are really big KOLs in the space. So it's really been fun, you know, kind of to see that partnership and see see the therapy grow up with along with the people that I worked alongside of. I had the privilege to really work with the um, class A, the best of the best, the creme de la creme of cardiologists in that space. So that was different in and of itself, going from a commercial to a trial state and then leading a team. We had to build the team as well there. And I looked for certain profiles that were really clinically astute to be able to do that. And now it's even, I'm even more curious because now you're telling me that you weren't even managing the same type of team. So how did you, how did you get that in order? Yeah. Um, my, so my leadership style changed just because of the nature of the job change. Right. Right. So it, it was a director level. Uh, and then I went global after that. So it was director level, but just because it was trial and it wasn't commercial, you're, you're a little bit different in, in your style. Um, the one thing that I loved about that is when you're bringing an innovative therapy to the market, some, something similar like what we'll do at Renata, you, uh, really ask a lot of questions. And that's something different. Sales reps oft, often get into a presentation mode mm -hmm. and they don't hear the customers. They don't do the discovery phase. Maybe they just, you know, one of the biggest mistakes early on in your career is you just kind of dive right into your sales pitch and Verbal you don't have discovery, right? <laughs> and so what I really learned from a leadership perspective is when you're in that discovery phase, there's so much to there's so much value in asking questions and really understanding the physician's challenges with patients, the, you know, the, the various things that are important to make your sales process move forward. And so that was a lovely thing that I really learned because I really, we all learned together. And, uh, and then now back at Renata, similar, you know, that we're going to bring this breakthrough technology to the market. And it's something they've not had before. And it's going to change the career, or, I mean, the, the care pathway of these patients. And so if you ask a lot of questions, it's very helpful. And then again, bringing the team together from a leadership style, learning from the mistakes as well as the successes. And you just got to keep repeating that. That has to be a repeated in ingredient that you bring the team together to discuss those things to further, you know, better the business. I love it. And, and the fact that you were made a director in a completely different space, gave you a whole new set of skills that you ultimately took to director of sales uh, for cardiac surgery. That's correct. Uh, so from there, I was a director of sales um, over in Europe. So I moved to Europe for Medtronic and did that in that space. So you, you know, I'm going to have to spend some time there. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get the full picture here for our audience. So what's going on? Are you are you 
family? Do we have kids? Are we saying everyone's relocating to Europe? Are we by ourselves? What's exact? This is this is 2016, 2019. So this is a this wasn't too long ago. Talk to no. us. So in fact, I did it. I had global responsibility based in the United States, and I got the call from my boss. You need to go. We need you to go to Europe for a year. Fi go fix Europe. That wow. was her. That wow. was her comment to me. You need to take us from number two to number one. And so that was the, the assignment. I happened to be dating my, who's now my husband. He, he's Italian. And Everybody, we didn't plan this, but go ahead. It's true. Uh, I say he's the best souvenir I got, you know, out of Europe. So, um, so, so for me, it was a no brainer. It was a one year assignment. Um, I've always loved Europe. I love the European, European people. And I couldn't imagine, you know, from a, business perspective, how much that was going to make me grow, because you have to understand social medicine versus private practice in the United States. Yeah. You have to understand the motivations, the different countries. I, I lived in Switzerland that year and uh, I had responsible for EMEA and um, but I was still functioning in the global role from an education perspective. So part of my plan was to get make sure the sales team was competent that we understood our gaps mm -hmm. and I re retrofitted everything. So I redesigned kind of the curriculum and retrofitted and uh, did some things that put them in a better position above their competition that they didn't think were, was possible, but I pushed for that. We did that. I worked very closely with all the business leaders in the different uh, countries and the regions. And sure. again, drove towards that mission and we accomplished the goal. And wow. so- Wow. And I was supposed to come back to the United States and the director of sales quit. And they said, do you want to come on a European contract? So then I moved over there permanently on a European contract. Wow. Okay. So in Europe, I mean, gosh, talk about a culture shift. You had a lot to manage because on, on the, on the one forefront, you're dealing with your, your career and trying to get the ship in order and whatever resistance you met with the American coming over them, telling them what to do. And on the whole other forefront, you're literally having to learn how to live in, in this whole new uh, country. Talk to us a little bit about that. You know, what, did you get a lot of resistance? Did you not? Uh, were they kind of like, we're not, we know we're not doing it right. Please tell us what to do. Or was it something different? You know, I was very, I think it's important. Um, I, again, I would recommend if anybody had an opportunity to be an expat, do it because it makes you grow in so many different perspectives. And I understood, you know, I didn't want to be the loudmouth American over there. That's, that was the, the perception, you know, that they have sometimes of us. So again, it was very important to understand country by country. And there's, you know, really the big five countries over there that drive the, the revenue um, is to understand what they were faced with and understand the different challenges and what happens in Italy is different than what happens in the UK versus France. So they all had different dynamics. Uh, so understanding that before you move forward. And then again, um, I was empowered to move forward. I did encounter quite a bit of resistance at first, and then, I, but then they started to see the success. So, and the differentiation in the sales force, which is really what I was trying to do is differentiate our sales force versus the competition okay. and give them the tools to be able to do that. So, you know, success, you can't argue with that. Um, they probably did think I was a little bossy at first, but they got used to it and eventually yeah. liked the results. Right, right. And, um, so it was great. It was really, really an incredible um, journey. And, and then I chose to, you know, to move back to the United States um, for some, uh, an, uh, another opportunity. So it was now, now between you and I, is, is Europe a place you could, you could relocate there and live there permanently based on your experience yes. or no? Yes. I, 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 I say, I've always said this, I'm truly a European trapped in an American body. <laughs> uh, so you, you, you were adjusting, you were thriving over there. Yes, I loved it. I really, really loved it. And my husband's Italian. So he, his, my stepdaughters live in Italy and in-laws live in Italy and, and all of that. So that'll eventually be a place where we'll, we will retire. Yeah. Oh, that is fantastic. You know, gosh, yeah. You know, uh, global living is something that I am such a ridiculously huge fan of. Uh, I incorporate some of that in my own life. So to hear that you are on your way to, to just making that be the thing that is, is fantastic. All right, so 
you, you know, and, and this is so good, you know, because I think it's important that people see the the opportunities a career in medical sales can actually provide. I mean, here you are, someone that you had a personal experience that that allowed you to pursue your passion, to address your personal experience and do more for others. And it took you on this journey that had you running a whole division in Europe. <laughs> and now and now you're you're literally going to Italy and 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 other countries in Europe as, as on a regular basis. And it's all it's all uh thanks to your involvement in this career. I think that's that's a beautiful thing. It really is. And I, I look at my career, it's been a lifetime journey. I have not isolated career personal. They've they, they've been really, you know, truly blended. And I think about that, you know, the physicians I've met along the way, they've helped my family when I've had medical crises. I've been able to intervene for, you know, family and friends on certain medical decisions and reroute, you know, to, to maybe a, a better physician to treat their family. Uh, I think about, you know, my kids were able to, you know, graduate college without debt. Yeah. I, yeah. Got, you know, I found my husband. I've got, you know, all these beautiful things that intertwine with your career journey. And I would say, you know, to, to your team, to your, to your listeners, you know, follow your heart. That's going to be your biggest, you know, mission inspiring thing that's going to guide you. Um, you know, be sure you follow the innovation. For me, I knew I wanted to be in cardiac. That was my biggest interest. And, you know, follow the innovation that there's very innovative there and your career will continue to unfold and you'll have opportunities um, that will that will come of that. And then I would say follow the leader um, because leaders make a difference uh, in, in your career path, um, but they also come and go out of the, the jobs that you might be at. So it's important to build your stakeholder network. And um, and I think if you can, you know, really uh do those key things that you'll have a really beautiful career and a life and and your Love family will too you know couldn't be said better um real quick so so then from medtronic director of sales you went to abbott as west area vice president talk to us a little bit about why the move what 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 was it something that you were tapped on again or was it something that you said you know what i see that's out there i want it talk to us a little bit about what, what went behind that decision At Actually, um, so when I left Medtronic, I was in Europe. So I decided to move back to the United States. And again, it was an opportunity. I was at two different parts of Abbott. Um, one was acquired CSI and then the other was Abbott. So both the Western Area Vice President was a step up again for the United States. And then I moved into the um, area of, um, the, um, the area Vice President at Abbott for Tabby to build their business. So for me, I've been in the Tabby space for 13 years. And it was quite natural to build a business. I've been able to build multiple businesses through my career. Yeah. And that was really the attraction for the move. And uh, I love starting from scratch, you know, and just it's it's so cool. I mean, if you think about it, your you know, your fingerprint is on every single yeah. thing. And I just love the creativity behind that. It also challenges me too. I mean, I'm today at Renata, I'm doing things I never thought I would be doing. But I didn't even, I'm, it's, sometimes it's overwhelming. You go, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. You know? And then you just have to kind of work through it and you, you get over on the you know other side of that. And it's great. It feels like you've got, uh, you've accomplished something. So, you know, for me, um, I think the decision was really based off of uh, the therapy. Uh, I love, I, I really loved the tabby space, but I also knew it was time to leave it. And, uh, and, and then kind of rejoin back to why I got into the business in the congenital space. I think it's just really beautiful place for me to be and, and a place for me to end my career. Um, but the opportunity and the reason why it, I was driven there was because of the therapy, but also people recruited me. <laughs> and so I wasn't necessarily looking, um, yeah. but you know, when, when your old boss calls you back and, and wants you to come work for them, you know, you, when you like that boss and you like the opportunity, it, say it, no. it's hard to say no. And if you're called back and I, I call many of my, my people that I've hired, they've kind of traveled with me to multiple companies. Um, if I call you back, you know, you're good because I know what I'm getting. <laughs> that is awesome. You know, you know, what's so cool about your career, Sydney, you, you literally, your passion for building businesses 
and your passion for being in this space of, of cardiology, it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it screams at you, you know, it's, it's undeniable that you clearly have a skill in building businesses that keeps taking you to higher levels. And it's undeniable that you clearly have a passion in cardiology and your, your, your entire career track reflects that. You know, you, you bring up a great point. Um, you, the beauty, the beautiful thing about being a sales rep is you own your career. You own your career. And, you know, when I would make a move, I was making it for the right reasons, but the title doesn't hurt. You know, like you're, you kind of self promote yourself. You know what I mean? To, to get to that next level. Yeah. The other, the other thing is you have to sit in a company long enough to be recognized for that opportunity to come available as a regional manager, you know, there's more of those than there are as vice presidents. So you, you have to be there long enough to wait for the opportunity to be able to come or make a jump out of the company to go get to the next level. If you have to do it, if it's the right, right you know, right path for you. So I think it's really important. People take ownership of their career. The companies never do that. They may have, you know, an individual development plan or performance. Hey, it's time now. That yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you, you really control that. And so many of my moves I made for, you know, they were promotional in nature, but I really loved the mission and I really loved building the businesses. So it all kind of fit. So sure. I would tell, you know, people who are starting out in the business, get settled, perform, you know, be there long enough. You know, it seemed like every three years something was coming up on my plate. It kind of seemed like that was the natural cadence, yeah. you know, and then, you know, make the move. But again, follow the innovation, make sure you're getting in a good place, um, especially in this space. This isn't, you know, like you, you can't, you know, you, you can't be with a bad product. Um, that's career ending for, for most people, you know, so, um, and you need, you need the performance in order to get to your next level along with other attributes. So, um, you know, I think that's really important. You know, so there's a narrative that this generation, the, the latest generation of workers really sees value in not spending time at one company. And, and even in the, in the vein of, getting those bigger titles, getting those bigger opportunities, more responsibility, jumping from company to company, trying to get what you can and then leverage the larger title into the next company you join and then doing the same thing in the next company. What is your perspective on that? Um, I do see with the younger generation in general, the, you know, because I, I look at a lot of resumes, of course, there are a lot of job jumps. And I would say as a hiring leader, um, that's always a red flag for me. So if I'm interested enough, I will inquire um, because you've got the background I'm looking for or, you know, you're competitive. I love hiring athletes because they're very competitive. Um, and so I'll look at their sales performance. And then if they've made logical leaps, then I can get to the place where I'm going to interview them. Sure. If, they, if they've made too many leaps, I usually won't. There's a red flag there to me. So I usually... I will hesitate before I would inquire. If I do then get the chance to interview them, then I'll really dive into that just to, you know, eliminate the concern. Um, but if it's logical, it will make sense. But I do see more movement and it will be a watch out for, you know, the generation of people that are hiring, um, you know, to, to be a little hesitant. I, I know that's, that's a well heard. I hope everyone's taking notes uh, right now. So, Let's let's bring this to a close, Sydney. But before we do, anything you'd like to share? I mean, you you told us so many great pearls about what people should be thinking about that are thinking about into medical sales. Let's address those that are in medical sales right now. They're thinking of ways to really get ahead and and maybe have a career that looks kind of like yours, uh, and maybe even get an opportunity to be outside of the country and 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 have a stint there. What would you tell them uh, right now? I would say um, uh, to, to break into this space, if, if it depends on what point in their career they're at, to break in this space, it just takes a lot of um, attempts. So, you know, network, um, work with companies like yourself that are really committed to their growth 
They really need to be sure they're polished on their interviews, that it's, it's situational interviewing. A really good interviewer will do situational interviewing, which means, you know, asking the question and they want they want you to answer based on how you did that and of course the end result and the impact. Mm -hmm. So um, they're looking for characteristics. So a really good interviewer will move to, towards that and let you do most of the talking. One of the things that I do in interviews, not that you, you asked me this is, but I do try to get them relaxed mm -hmm. so that I kind of see the, the real person behind mm -hmm. the scenes right. um, and kind of try to break down the walls, maybe take them to lunch or something like that. And you can kind of get a little more out of them and get a feel for them, things of that nature. But the interview, preparing for the interview is really what's going to set you apart, get you to the next step. So piece by piece, one, don't give up you know, keep interviewing. The more interviews you do, the better off you will be. The more prepared you are, the better off you will be. It's not enough to just have a 90 day plan that looks like it's just a 90 day plan. Right. You got to go above and beyond these days. But, you know, it needs to be customized, thought mm -hmm. out. You need to take initiative and your due diligence, which would mean maybe reaching out to people in that space if you're interviewing. So breaking into the space is, uh, is tough to do. And it's, you can't treat interviewing as a benign experience. You really sure. have to be prepared. Um, and every interview I've ever done, I've always anticipated the questions they'd ask me. And then I'd walk myself through that situational interviewing. Okay, this was, you know, what I did and how I did it. And then here's the impact. And so I would have my answers, you know, ready to go. So really working with companies like yourself that, prepare people to get into the space and then be better is great. And then networking Excellent. and then, you know, staying visible. So that, that, those would be my big, you know, tips of the day. And, and for those that want to just get ahead that are ready in that are individual contributors and in companies right now, and they're trying to get opportunities like what you created for yourself, what would you tell, what would you tell them should be their, their primary focus if they have this kind of ambition? I would tell them collaboration with cross-functional partners, ex, um, expand your network and endorsement, find a good mentor to help, you know, challenge you, and then sign up for team lead type projects. So mm -hmm. if you have the ability as, even as a rep, you know, to help lead a cross-functional project that you electively want to sign up for, it will help give you more dimension to your role and make you more valuable. So if you can do some of those types of things, that would be very, very helpful from, you know, moving to the next level or into a leadership position. So sign up for like team lead type projects that can bring cross-functional uh, teams together and then you get the visibility. Fantastic. And sit long enough at the company in order to get promoted. <laughs> You heard her. You heard, so, so three years, no, no less than three years. I'd say no less than three years. Cause usually, you know, you got your performance behind you and you're established. So there you, go. you got, you, you heard it from her. You heard it from her, everyone on that note, Sydney, this has been fantastic. We have one more thing to do before, before I let you go today. It's called the lightning round. Are you ready? Uh Oh, I guess I have to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. You have less than 10 seconds to answer four questions. And, and let's get started. The first question is, what is the best book you've read in the last six months? Mm, I don't, you know what? I, le I read publications. Okay. I don't the best publication you've read in the last six months? Um, gosh, I would say, well, I've read multiple congenital heart disease publications. <laughs> so I'd say the guidelines on, on congenital heart disease. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? That that's an answer. All right. What is the best TV show or movie you've seen in the last six months? Oh gosh, I'm I'm watching The Affair right now, so <laughs> on Netflix. So that's probably discredited everything I just said. Oh, that's good. That, that, that is is it good? It is good. Yes, okay. it's good. All right. Third question: What's the best meal you've had in the last six months? We want the item and the restaurant. Location, item, and restaurant. Oh gosh. Um, well, I am always up for Italian food. Um, probably I'd say the best restaurant is my husband's cooking right at home with, with, with gnocchi, gnocchi, pesto gnocchi, or, you know, he, I mean, he's got all sorts of little things that he, he comes up with, so that counts. 
some of the chefs that cook Italian listening right now, you know, here's some things you can you can really entertain with your next set of guests. And last but not least, what is the best experience you've had in the last six months? Uh, I would say having my adult kids and their significant others together around the dinner table with my husband. That's yeah. Good. Because we don't get to get together that often. And watching your kids grow up and be beautiful people and the people they're dating be beautiful people, it's the best um, thing that a parent could ever uh, wow. enjoy. Yeah. Doesn't get better than that. That's fantastic. Sydney, it was an absolute pleasure uh, learning from you today and seeing all the amazing things you're doing out there. We can't wait to see what's to come. And thank you again for being on the Medical Sales Podcast. Demo, you are so great. You're such a breath of fresh air. Thank, Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And that was Sydney Selby. So, I mean, <laughs> there's only so much I can say after that. A phenomenal career. She clearly, from the jump, was in the right place. Milestone after milestone, accomplishment and achievement after accomplishment and achievement. And, and again, I said it in the episode and I'll say it again. What I loved so much from her career is that theme that her passion was clearly to be thrown into a situation where results and order was not there and create results in order and then move on to a bigger and better opportunity. That is her theme. That is what she's done. That is literally her skill set. And she's leveraged it into the highest opportunity she could with the opportunity she has today. It's amazing. It's inspirational. And it's something we should all be striving to do. So if you're someone that heard this episode and you're thinking to yourself, I want to make this happen. What do I need to do? How do I get to where she is? How do I even put myself on a pathway to entertain getting to where she is? Then you know what I'm going to tell you. Go to evolversuccess.com, select the application, fill it out, schedule some time with one of our account executives, take the assessment, and let's get you to where you need to be. It's groundbreaking, life changing work, and we want you to be a part of it. You're not listening to this podcast for your health. You're listening to, well, you kind of are, but you're also listening to it because you know there's opportunity out there that's for you and we can help you get there. So visit evolvesuccess.com. As always, we do our best to bring you guests that are doing things differently in the medical sales space. So make sure you tune in next week for another episode of the Medical Sales Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a customized and personalized program that gets you into the medical technology industry as a sales professional or any type of role for that matter. Become a top performer in your position and masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveSuccess.com by visiting our site, filling out an application, schedule some time with one of our account executives and allowing us to get you where you need to be. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews on the Medical Sales Podcast.